Welcome to video 2 for week 10. In this video we're going to do the chain rule, which is like the single variable chain rule a technique, but it also relates to the general project that I'm trying to get at in these two weeks of figuring out what the derivative should mean for scalar fields. So the chain rule doesn't generalize directly. If I have two functions that are single variable functions, I can compose them and still get a single variable function. So then I need to know how to differentiate a composition. That's what we did for chain rule for single variable functions. However, if I have two scalar fields, then this composition doesn't even work because the output of G is the real numbers and the input of F is Rn. So I can't even define this. This doesn't even make sense. So the chain rule is not for the composition of two scalar fields. What composition is it for? Well, if I have a scalar field and I have a parametric curve, then this composition makes sense because the parametric curve outputs Rn and then the scalar field inputs Rn and then outputs again a real number. So this actually gives me in composition a single variable function. I start with one variable, I end with one variable, but I go via Rn in the middle in this composition. So the chain rule is going to apply to scalar fields acting on parametric curves. And I want to talk a little bit about what that means using the example of potential energy. I could have used a bunch of different examples, but this one has some nice historical importance as well. So say I've got a composition here. Gamma is a path, and P is the potential energy scalar field. So what this is talking about is we've got some path going through Rn, some path here, and then we have the potential energy along that path. So this function is telling us how the potential energy changes as we move along that path. So the derivative should be the rate of change of potential energy. So the question of what this derivative is, is as we move along this path in Rn, how does our potential energy change? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? How quickly? Where are the maximums? Where are the minimums? All of those derivative questions. So it is still a single variable thing. Potential energy depends here on t and outputs a scalar, but it's happening in a multi-dimensional space because the path goes all through this Rn. All right, here's the definition. We have a function and we have a parametric curve. The chain rule for the derivative ddt, this is not a partial since this is a single variable derivative, is something that looks a lot like the chain rule in single variable, where we sort of differentiate the outside and then we differentiate the inside. But we have to do this in each of the variables, and then we just add up all of these terms. So these outside partials are the derivative of the scalar field in its variables, and the inside partials are the derivative, or not partials rather, the inside derivatives are the derivatives of the component, component functions of the parametric curve. So this x1 is the first component of gamma, this x2 is the next component of gamma, so forth and so on. If I wanted to state it in R3, it would look like this. The key thing to remember here is that these x's um, are the variables of the scalar field, but also the outputs of the parametric curve. What you are not seeing here is sort of this evaluation bar that I used in single variable calculus. We still have to sort of do this step, which I'll talk about in the examples, but it typically doesn't become part of the notation anymore. All right, let me do an example, particularly to show what that evaluation bar step looks like. So here's a scalar field in R2. Here's a parametric curve in R2. So I compose the scalar field along the parametric curve. I'm asking, how does this scalar field change as I move along this path? Take this derivative, I get the x and y pieces, so like the chain rule, but one piece for each variable. So I take the partial of f and x, the partial of f and y. I take the derivative of the components, so this is the derivative of the first component in t of the parametric curve. This is the derivative of the second component in t of the parametric curve. Here I have something that looks really weird because it's got t variables and it's got x and y variables. So here's where we would do sort of the, we've done the derivatives so that u equals g of x step from single variable chain rule would happen here. What that means here is that the x's and y's of the scalar field have to be replaced with the components of the parametric curve. So we know how the scalar field changes, but then we have to evaluate the field on the curve because we're not thinking about the scalar field everywhere. We're only thinking about how it acts on the curve. So I'm going to erase a little bit to show more clearly what's going on. This x gets replaced with t squared over 4. This y gets replaced with 1 minus c squared. This y gets replaced there. 
uh, this x gets replaced there, this x gets replaced there. So I've replaced all of the x's and y's with the components of the parametric curve. And now I have an expression that's all in the variable t, and it tells me how quickly this scalar field changes as I move along the parametric curve. Since movement along the parametric curve is in the variable t, I should get an expression that just involves variable t. And then I simplified this. There's a bunch of multiplications to do. Uh, I've got a bunch of terms multiplied together, so I just multiply everything out, went to common denominator, simplified this down, and I get this expression. Uh, so that's the degree six polynomial it tells me how this scalar field changes as I move in time along this parametric curve. Let me finish by going back to potential energy, which was a motivating example I used earlier in the video. So this is your potential energy scalar field. Um, R is the distance, so the distance in R3 is going to be the square root of x squared y squared plus z squared, assuming that the large mass m is centered at the origin, which is our assumption. Potential energy uh, is considered zero very, very far away, so sort of at infinity, and it decreases to negative infinity as we move closer and closer to the origin. That's the convention for these potential energy things, with the idea that objects want to decrease their potential energy. So objects are attracted to the central mass because they want to lower their potential energy. Potential energy is zero very, very far away and becomes a very large negative number as we get close to the center. So here, here's a path. This is a helical path. So this is going like this, sine and cosines are spinning around in the x and y plane, and then the z coordinate is increasing in t. So I want to know if I have some object m and I've got this helical path around it, what's happening to the potential energy as I move along this helical path. So I have to calculate the change in potential energy using the chain rule, because I'm taking this scalar field composing with this parametric curve. There is the definition of the chain rule. I have three components because this is three variables. So I need the partial derivatives of this. Uh, I've calculated those here, one, two, and three. Their denominators are all the same. They differ in the numerators. The x partial is x, the y partial is y, the z partial has z. Uh, and then I need to multiply those by the rates of change of the parametric curve. To calculate those, uh, the derivative of sine is cosine, derivative of cosine is negative sine, derivative of t is one. I also replace the x, y, and z with sine, cosine, and t. So I replace the x, y, and z with the components of the parametric curve. And then all of these have the same denominator. Um, here I'm going to get sine times cosine. Here I'm going to get sine times negative cosine. So these two terms are actually going to cancel each other out. They're going to be the same term, one with a positive sign, one with a negative sign. So all I have left is this term. And I can simplify it into this expression at the bottom, which I've written over a little bit, but I'll erase to sort of show. And then let me give an interpretation of what's going on here. So this is increasing. Everything here is positive. And that makes sense, because I'm moving in this helical path, I'm moving away from the central mass. If you move away from the central mass, your potential energy should increase. So on this path, my potential energy is increasing. But I have t in the numerator, and this is asymptotically t cubed in the denominator, because the squared and the square roots cancel out, so that works out to t cubed. So I'm going to be increasing at a slower and slower rate as I go along. And that makes sense, because as you get farther and further away, the relative change in potential energy gets smaller and smaller. So as I'm very near the object in the spinning path, I'm going to be gaining potential energy quickly. But as I get further away, I'll be gaining potential energy less quickly because the change in potential energy is less significant the further I am away. And that's the chain rule. So movement along a parametric curve, evaluating what changes we have to a scalar field while we move along a parametric curve.